Now, as I mentioned there, the academic journal History and Technology has claimed the 18th century ironware producer Henry Colt stole his idea for an iron-making process from Jamaican slaves, but some leading Oxbridge historians said there was no basis for the claim, only to be accused of white domination. So joining us now is a leading historian at the University of Cambridge, Robert Toombs. Welcome to the show. Uh, can I first ask Let's you about you. this article? It's making some unsubstantiated claims, and critics have pointed out that these claims are unsubstantiated. What should the editors be saying to that kind of complaint? They should be saying, we've investigated, we found that the claims made in this article were unsubstantiated, and therefore the article is going to be withdrawn. It should be an apology for having published uh, an argument that simply has no basis in fact, has no basis in evidence. Uh, but uh, what they've done instead is, is think that they can just brazen it out uh, it, under a sort of, uh, you know, smokescreen of verbiage. And as you say, by playing the race card. Well, they're suggesting that, um, the, well, they're even calling into question the idea that saying that facts matter, uh, that that would be a problem when it comes to historical investigation. Why on earth are they, are they doing that? Well, empiricism is a colonial construct, is more or less what they say. The facts are what we say they are, because we're in the right and you're in the wrong, because we are modern and you're old fashioned, and because uh, we stand for the, you know, for the, 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 the global south and you, you stand for white domination. I mean, for me, and I think for many people uh, who are historians, whether Henry Court or slaves in Jamaica invented this process is not of any great importance. Although the, the author of the article has, as you said, um, used it as a as an argument in favour of reparations. I mean, if if it was if it was slaves who invented this process, I'd say, wow, that's really interesting. You know, uh, let's look at the evidence and see. But the the fact there is there is no evidence. It's been carefully examined, and it's just um, a succession of maybes and perhapses and wouldn't it be nice ifs? It's really basically that. And, and presumably, say that historians would be more than happy to change their minds if new evidence were to emerge. Well, certainly I would hope so. I, I, I don't see how one could not. You know, historians spend all their time trying to interpret evidence. That's what we do. And if someone comes up with new evidence and an exciting new uh, interpretation, then most people say, wow, isn't that great? Uh, but in this case, you just have to say, well, the, you know, the emperor's got no clothes on, and this just doesn't make any sense. And the worrying thing, I think, is, is not particularly this claim. You know, young, young historians can make excessive claims. It's not uncommon. I may have done it myself in my younger days. But to say, well, we don't really care. You know, we, we don't care whether the evidence is there or not, because we know that we want this to be true, and therefore it is true. Now, I've spoken to other historians who've said to me that they feel that within the discipline of history generally, this is creeping in more and more, that people are uh, actually considering their own ideological wishful thinking, I suppose, to be more important than the facts. How widespread do you think this really is? It's quite widespread in certain areas. I mean, m most, in most history, it, it's, not, it's not really a presence. Um, but in certain areas, particularly concerned with you know, global history, the history of, of, of empire or post-imperial studies, in that sort of thing, it's become, it's become the norm. You, know, you, you won't have people who work on, you know, the history of the First World War or the, or the Wars of the Roses or the, or the Roman Empire doing this kind of thing. It's particularly in those areas which are so ideologically potent and controversial that this happens quite commonly. Yes, I mean, one of the ones we've heard uh, a number of times is the notion that Winston Churchill was responsible for the Bengal famine. And a lot of the people making that claim uh, tend to omit an awful lot of evidence in order to make that claim. Uh, do you think at any point they reflect and think, well, if I'm having to fabricate things, maybe I'm wrong? I think in this particular case, it's mainly uh, the product of Indian or Hindu nationalism. Um, I don't think there are serious historians, certainly not serious historians of Churchill who believe this, because as you say, once you start um, researching this subject, you realize that it's an awful lot more complicated than that. So, you know, the people who say, oh, well, Churchill deliberately starved 20 million people to death are just saying, I don't understand what this is all about, but I've heard somebody say this, so I'm going to say it as well. So what do you think can be done? Uh, I mean, this is a broader problem in academia more generally, where the idea of uh, a lot of activists, well, I suppose academics who are activists first and academics second, have an awful lot of clout and sway. Uh, is it, isn't this only going to get worse? Yes, I think it probably is. And I think the, 
the, the reason is that academic careers are now largely determined by the ability to raise research funding and, of course, by the ability to be published in journals like this. And therefore, you know what it is you have to say in order to get money for your research, to get promotion or to get a job and to get yourself published. Um, it's becoming more and more dangerous for people to, to, to go against the established orthodoxy, which is becoming more and more the sort of orthodoxy that this journal um, uh, embodies. Robert Toombs, thank you ever so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.